Welcome back to the RSET training, large-scale applications of machine learning using remote sensing for building agriculture solutions. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm an RSET trainer based out of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. I want to welcome you all to the second part of the three-part webinar series. The following slides provide an overview of the three-part webinar series. The motivations for hosting this training topic are that timely and accurate in-season crop maps at local to regional scales is crucial for agricultural decision making and management. Irregularly spaced time series are common with optical satellite images. Training robust models on remote sensing data often requires very large data, but processing and training is complex. The cropland data layer provided by the United States Department of Agriculture's National Agricultural Statistics Service only gives estimates of the types of crops released to the public a few months after the end of the growing season and not their sequence or timing, for example, double cropping. By the end of this training series, participants will be able to use recommended techniques to download and process remote sensing data from Sentinel-2 and the cropland data later at large scales with cloud tools, produce interactive plots and maps, tables, time series for investigation and verification of data and models, filter data from both the measured and target domains to serve modeling objectives based on quality factors, land classification, area of interest overlap, and geographical location, build a training type pipelines in TensorFlow to train machine learning algorithms on large-scale remote sensing geospatial datasets for agricultural monitoring, and utilize random sampling techniques to build robustness into a predictive algorithm while avoiding information leakage across training, validation, and testing splits. The prerequisites for the second part of this training are a general understanding of Python programming in Databricks from part one, access to the associated data from part one, and to sign up for and access the Databricks Community Edition. A link to sign up for the Databricks Community Edition is provided on the slide. Over these three weeks, there will be three one and a half hour sessions, which will include presentations, demonstrations, and question and answer sessions. All materials, code, and recordings from each session will be available from the training webpage. If you are not able to attend one part, a recording will be made available within 48 hours of the training day on the RSET website. Homework opens on March 19th and will be due on April 1st. You will be able to access the homework from the training page starting on March 19th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment before the given due date. Please put your questions in the question box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Feel free to enter your questions as we go. We will try to get to all the questions during the question and answer session after the presentations and demonstrations have concluded. The remainder of the questions will be answered in the Q&A document, which will be posted to the training website prior to the start of next week's training. I will now pass the presentation over to our guest instructors for this webinar series, Dr. John Just and Eric Sorensen from John Deere. John and Eric, over to you. Okay, thank you all for joining us again for part two in our series on large scale applications of machine learning using remote sensing for building agriculture solutions. This part is on data loaders for training ML models on irregularly spaced time series. So it, our focus here is on imagery specifically as a data source. I'll be the speaker for the PowerPoint presentation or the slide deck part of this. And my name is John Just. I'm a principal data scientist at John Deere. I'm also affiliate faculty at Iowa State University in the Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering Department. Uh, joining me is also Eric Sorensen. Eric, can you introduce yourself? Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, yep, my name is Eric. I'm a senior data scientist at John Deere, and I'll be giving the demo of the code um, in this part. Thank you, Eric. Some objectives for this part we have for everyone is that by the end, you'll be able to use Python and Databricks Community Edition to understand how to split the data that we have into different parts, in this case, uh, a training, validation, and test set. And that's specifically um, for during the experiment to avoid data leakage uh, that, that could affect um, performance of the model. Uh, we also look to teach everyone how to build, this is the core part of it, a specialized uh, optimized queue 
called uh, a data loader. Uh, really, that's we're going to use TensorFlow, but that's really what a data loader is. It's just an optimized queue, um, and what it'll do is it'll extract and uh, basically use the Parquet files that we uh, that we built in part one with all the data. Um, we'll be able to filter some data that we want to ignore. Um, we'll apply some augmentations that uh, help to uh, form the data so that uh, it's more um, uh, it's more optimal for uh, modeling purposes and we'll bucketize it then into a, 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 a regularly spaced time series from an irregularly uh, from, from an irregularly spaced time series um, so that will make it more conducive to using typical model source uh, model types and um, finally we'll normalize the values and that will uh, again be part of the optimization process so that uh, we can get a uh, robust convergence uh, during training, um, and then and then finally uh, we'll show a little bit of uh, information regarding how the queue is uh, optimized for speed by using parallelization. Some prior knowledge review: uh, we are really working with satellite imagery for the most part here, and there's a high amount of irregularity due to things like cloud cover. Um, the cropland data layer, which is a source of our ground truth, provides labels that we can uh, use as targets during training. It's covering the con uh, continental United States, um, and there's, it's released once, once a year at, at the end of the year. Um, so we have this, generally speaking, for the last uh, 20 years or so in the United States of data. We do store data uh, in the previous section um, or the previous part, we, we showed how we stored data as byte strings and parquet files. Um, that's a, it's not a, a human readable format, but it allows for efficient storage uh, of very large data. And then it also is, is smaller and, and helps uh, the load time be faster from disk. All right, so let's uh, get into section one of this part. Uh, this is about generally TensorFlow and how data flow works. Uh, within um, kind of a, a process to train models. So as an overview, TensorFlow itself, it's an open source library from Google. Um, it has quite a few uh, capabilities. Uh, we don't use all of them in this demo. Some of those like deploying models and implementing ML ops are really focused on uh, production deployments um, and maintaining models over time. So uh, those are nice capabilities for when you you are are moving to that large scale deployment, uh, part two, this part is focused on preparing the data. So uh, this is where the queue comes in, and or the the data loader comes in. Um, and then part three, next time we're going to focus on building ML models. So uh, that's a little bit of an overview of what we're planning and how it fits into TensorFlow's capabilities. Um, as far as data flow is concerned. Uh, we have three parts to this series, and uh, really the first part was focused on getting the data that we're going to use to model with, and and uh, uh, so we we did go over in that case um, getting the CDL data. We uh, focused on um, processing the satellite imagery at scale, and and so we got it into a form that was kind of uh, conducive to modeling as a time series. Uh, now for this part. Um, we're at the uh, part where we're going to use TensorFlow's data module, and this is going to really specifically focus on the, the extract, transform, and load functionality of TensorFlow. So those are part of the, the uh, we, we call that ETL oftentimes as an abbreviation, but those are part of the, um, the all part of the data model uh, within uh, TensorFlow's data loaders. And then the third part will again focus on model training, and inference uh, will specifically use TensorFlow's Keras in this case. All right, so section two, we'll talk a little bit about these TensorFlow data pipelines. Uh, there's a lot that could be said about these, uh, these functions. Again, this is really an optimized queue. So instead of bu building a queue from scratch that has all the, the, the capabilities we, we, we would want, uh, TensorFlow has done a, a great job of kind of uh, giving these Fun, given the functionality in a uh, a much nicer form, and it's really uh, quite simple compared to building your own. Um, 
there's some links we've provided here where you could go learn a lot more about each of the the options when uh, putting together one of these data loaders. But at a high level, uh, there's kind of a, a general suggested workflow that we we follow here. Um, and so this really, really, first of all, you you have to have some kind of uh, list of file paths or you have to you have to have your data in some form that you're going to essentially turn into a data set that we're we're then going to load. So in this case, um, it could be uh, it could be a list of file paths, but uh, we also in the, this particular data uh, this this tutorial this demo we actually load all the tables into memory and uh, our specific um, uh, sample will will not be a file or, or but it will actually be a row in memory a row from the table so um, and it's this is a little bit faster when uh, when it's when it's possible to do that since you already have it in memory you don't have to read from disk so uh, from there there's once we have this this list or this data set uh, kind of uh, specified there's a bunch of um, dot notation methods we can use uh, on on that particular data set to uh, essentially apply functions that are pretty typical typically desired uh, in, a, in a in a in a data loader. Uh, some of those we mentioned were like filtering. So if there's particular uh, data that's in our data set that we don't want to use um, or has some issues with it, um, instead of pre-filtering that, we allow uh, we we kind of have this option to dynamically filter that out during training because. Uh, it, it may it may change over time, and um, trying to uh, apply that on the data set prior to training may be kind of a hassle. So this is a nice function that we we will use here as well. Um, shuffling the data uh, is another function that we we often use, and it's it's highly recommended to shuffle your data so that you diversify the samples in each batch and ultimately get more robust grading updates to your model. Um, the map function is a very important piece where essentially we a, a lot of the, the the bulk of the work is done. That's where we're parsing the data and we're applying a lot of that transformation to the data to get it into a format where um, it's really kind of going to load and be ready to be put into a model. And uh, then we have our targets as well there in the right format. And then a couple final uh, functions that we use uh, and that are often used. You're going to have a batch of some kind, so you specify the batch size um, for each uh, for each batch, and then uh, we're going to have prefetch as well. Which this is kind of a uh, essentially specifying a background uh, set of processes, so that while the the main process is doing the training, uh, the background processes can be doing the uh, the the process the ETL the extract transform and load to the data and have it ready. So there's very minimal wait time when we need new data. This is an example implementation of that. So um, in, in TensorFlow code, you might have some, some list of files. Um, this has been specified as a TensorFlow data set. And so it's a data set object. We can apply a filter to something. So in this case, an example could be we're trying to filter double crops because um, we don't want to train on double crops in this case for, for some reason or whatever. Uh, shuffling, you got to specify um, some type of size to the buffer of the shuffle buffer. So uh, in this case, usually you want to make that uh, the size of the data set um, if you can. If you don't have enough uh, room to do that, then there's other ways to, to, to get around this. But typically speaking, you know, you, you probably want this to be big enough to shuffle your entire data set. Um, the map function here in this case uses uh, a, a Lambda format where we, we kind of have a, a parse function here. And um, we have the ability to actually specify um, parallel processing. So we have uh, a number of parallel calls could be, you could put a number in here or you could let uh, TensorFlow itself, like what's being done here, tune that number. Um, then again, dot batch and dot prefetch. And prefetch again specifies um, in some sense, uh, the number of uh, processes, background processes that might be going on to uh, to load your data in parallel with the um, the main training process. So you could also use uh, an auto tune uh, 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 argument here instead of just specifying it and let TensorFlow figure out what is optimal. 
Um, I want to specifically focus in on the map function since that again is where the bulk of the work uh, is done. The, the other pieces like um, filter, batch, and, and prefetch are really pretty straightforward. Map is where it, it, it can get very custom what you want to do here. Uh, in this case, we have some things like, you know, we might want to be reading from parquet files. Um, if, if we already have it in memory, we still have to use things like TF, uh, TFIO decode raw. This is actually going to uh, essentially um, take those byte strings that are very, um, you know, uh, that, that are essentially not in a form to, to model. We're going to convert those to uh, typical numbers or, or arrays or whatever. Uh, that we need to to actually work with that data. Um, we're also going to do a lot of the work to bucketize the data, so uh, there'll be some custom functions we need in there. Um, because when we break the data up into regular intervals, there may be you know zero to you know some number greater than one of images in any one bucket, and we have to do a selection process. Uh, we'll do some normalization of the data, encode the labels in in one hot encoding. Again, this is part of the just the, the standard format for training models, and you know we'll return it as a as a tuple of data, um, and and so this is this is the map function can do all this and uh, it can do it in parallel. So it's it's quite a powerful uh, function. Uh, specifically, I just wanted to to highlight the uh, the the way that we are uh, decoding the byte strings. Um, when you look at the table that the data is stored in, it's it's stored in uh, really kind of what, what looks like unreadable um, text strings. And these the reason these show up like this, so if you look at the bands uh, column, which actually should be the values associated with the different bands in each, um, each uh, scene that we processed per pixel, um, it, it, you see like uh, really an unreadable string of, of characters. That's that's because that's how a byte string shows up and when you actually try to view it. So we need to decode that into real numbers. And so when we decode it, we get numbers back that uh, are are clearly what we would expect for band values for, for Sentinel-2. So that's pretty straightforward to do by just using TensorFlow's decode raw button uh, or decode raw function, sorry. Um, it, there's a few things that are expected, like you have to actually specify the number of bytes and the, the data type, but uh, this is all fairly straightforward, and it can work with arrays pretty pretty easily as well, which is is kind of how we want the the uh, band data to be decoded, for instance. All right, uh, section three. So now we're going to go through exactly what's entailed in preparing the data set. So we've kind of covered generally how we use TensorFlow data sets and some of the main functions and methods available. Um, now we'll talk about what we're actually focusing on for this data. Uh, First of all, one of the most important pieces of the particular data that we're using, um, but it's all, this is more general than just our data. We, we, need to we need to split the data into train, validation, and test sets. Um, this, is not, this is not specific to time series data. This is done for any type of data source. Uh, the reason for this is that we use these validation and test data sets for things other than training a model. Um, it, we and specifically, the validation data set can be used to avoid overfitting um, for tuning hyperparameters, and then the test data set can be used to gauge real world real world performance. Um, really, all of this uh, translates to we're trying to get the best performance out of the model uh, were it to be applied in production or or generalized to new data that wasn't seen. Uh, a common split of the data could be that you're putting 80% uh, of it towards training and then reserving 10% for validation and another 10% for test. Uh, this can vary, but generally speaking, you're putting a, a, a lot more into your training than you are into the other, the other two, but you're reserving something that's enough to uh, get a, a, a good convergence of your model um, and, and also test the generalization performance. Uh, so uh, this is somewhat shown by this curve here. Um, you know, the validation data set is essentially reserved so that uh, oftentimes what will happen is your model can overfit to the training data and you won't even know that it's actually happening. Uh, but if you're watching during training a, your validation data and how your model is performing on the validation data, which is not being used to, to 
perform gradient updates, you'll see a point where it kind of bottoms in, in the performance of it, and then the performance actually starts to get worse. So in this case, the loss is the, um, the whatever the metric is we're using to judge the model performance, and at some point it hits a, a, an optimal value on the validation data and then starts to increase. And this is the point where you'd want to stop training the model. Um, you don't you don't monitor the, the training data set because generally speaking, the training loss will continue to decrease uh, if you keep training. Uh, so specifically for crop type prediction, what we really care about is uh, not leaking information across time and space. Um, this is a very subtle but important um, point. When you split the data with uh, satellite imagery, um, or any type of data set that, that has some spatial and, and temporal component to it, um, you, you wanna make sure not to leak that data uh, by essentially using uh, some type of data in the training data set that, that may also somehow be very highly correlated with training in the validation or test data sets um, for some reason. So that could look like sampling, uh, like uh, data from nearby, uh, locations from the same year. So uh, we already know that generally speaking, agricultural practices will be very similar when you're looking at places in certain areas um, that are close together and over over the same time frame. So like, uh, you know, if we're looking at like a, a specific um, 10 mile you know, radius of one point, uh, you expect all the farming practices within a 10 mile radius uh, of a specific point to be more similar than, you know, places that are hundreds of miles away. And the, the same is true across years. So generally the, the weather conditions from one year to another can change a lot, but they're fairly similar within one year. So you, you will see that uh, by splitting the data um, in some way that avoids uh, leaking that information, you'll actually test the model performance better. Um, in this case, the way that we handle this is we, we're looking really at the same area for, for training, validation, and, and test, but we're splitting it across years. And uh, this, this is one way that's, that's convenient, and it also actually is fairly effective at uh, training models that are, are fairly robust and then testing their performance. Another important thing that we have to do is normalize the data. This is really uh, required for the optimization procedure, not, not much of anything else. So the, the band values uh, for satellite imagery are, uh, this is an example right here of a botch plot of the different band, 12 different band values from Sentinel-2. Um, they really have wide ranges and they're different for each band. Um, if we were to try to optimize uh, on these directly, so input these into the model, and then let the model learn its weights and biases based on these particular values of bands, uh, it will not actually achieve very good convergence during the training and optimization process. So in order to uh, get good convergence or optimal convergence, what we need to do is we need to actually normalize each of these bands individually by subtracting the mean and then dividing by the standard deviation. So at that point, each of these bands will essentially have a very similar uh, distribution. Now, there might be some different skewing characteristics on each of them, but at the very least, the mean and the standard deviation are very similar, and this ends up producing pretty good results in optimization in, re in, in practice. So, as, as an example, I took the VRE2 band here, um, and so I normalized this, and I went from you know ranges and, and values in the, in the thousands down to a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Bucketizing is another uh, key component of this work. Um, this is actually how the cropland data layer uh, does things as well. I believe they they bucketize their data in intervals, time intervals of two weeks. Um, the, here, this is just an example, but we we're bucketizing uh, in an, on an interview uh, interval of five days. Um, so in this case, uh, this example shows that. We have a time series of data. We've got some data available over this time frame, um, and so let's take a time frame of 45 days. We're we're going to go from April 10th all the way to May uh, 25th, and, and what we're going to do then is we're going to try to actually add in, um, uh, like we're split into basically five five day increment buckets, uh, and so when we do that we need to have a value in each of those increments. So if the data we actually have is available is only on these specific dates, 
what we're going to have to do is basically fill in or pad some values w where we did not have uh, a scene available to get to get some in that interval to get some type of value. So in this case, um, we had a, a value available on, for instance, April 10th. Um, we didn't have values available on the 15th and 20th. Um, but then when we go to, again, the 25th uh, and the 30th of April, we had some values uh, as well as the 5th of, of May, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we begin to pad values in here. And in this case, we're padding in zeros. Um, that's what we do here. That, that essentially amounts to, I, I kind of talk about it in the next slide, but uh, when you've normalized all the data, uh, a value of zero is really the mean value. So you're kind of padding with mean values here. And this works sufficiently well. Um, it's not, it's not a, there's no perfect solution here. You, one could try to interpolate values of some kind, but uh, that also gets kind of tricky. So uh, we find this works quite well. Uh, so again, kind of a view from a, a plotting standpoint of bucketizing the data. Um, here, we would have taken an interval over 45 days and uh, we've we've essentially um, or over uh, sorry, not 45 days in this case it's 180 day time frame um, we had we had available 38 images this is a real world example um, we had available 38 images and so by the time we actually split this in intervals uh, we find that these these uh, kind of gold to color dots at the bottom here they're all set to zero those are the the intervals where we didn't have an available satellite image but these other ones, they're colored, those are where we actually had a value. And so we're showing this via the, the in this case, the NDVI curve over this time frame. But um, this is this is kind of a, a visual of how we would pad and where we would see these zeros in, entered in. Uh, these The actual values, of course, um, of these are, are going to be uh, normalized as well. So there will be some value, you know, that, that's more, uh, more like the range we saw when I was normalizing data back here they'll be somewhere in this range for each uh, band value. So, and we'll we'll have 12 bands available for each of these. So in this case, when there were zeros, all 12 band values would get a, a value of zero. Um, but when there's actually a, a scene available, they will get the, the values from that scene. Okay. Uh, another thing we do that's, um, again, this is somewhat subtle, but we do want to avoid uh, trying to classify uh, a crop because we're doing this in real time. Our goal here is to classify crop types in real time. It's not just what happened over the entire year. Uh, because of that, it means that we could be trying to classify a crop at times when there's nothing growing. So if we look at earlier in the year, this would be um, January, uh, in, in this case, January uh, 2021, moving into all the way up to somewhere in probably around May 2021. There's really nothing growing in it during this time frame. Um, in this case, the gold colored dots are really signaling that, 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 that the, the uh, scene classification layer from Sentinel-2 is identifying that there's no vegetation uh, present. The scene classification layer uh, is actually fairly um, uh, precise when it comes to identifying if vegetation is growing or not. Um, so we can actually use this for our real-time predictions and uh, essentially filter to times when vegetation is present and, and make that when we predict. If we, if we can use the CDL and we see that there's not really any, any vegetation present uh, for our particular application, um, then we can just uh, ignore predicting at that point. Or we could apply some type of filter that requires vegetation having been present within some time frame. Um, one of the reasons to do that would be uh, sometimes there are cirrus like cl clouds that get into the mix. Um, that's what these blue dots here are. And so that can cause uh, uh, some specific time interval to not have uh, maybe the, the, the view of the, the ground, the surface, and, and get a, a, an accurate uh, estimate of if vegetation is on the surface or not. But uh, for the most part, this is a very uh, effective way to um, help identify when we might want to be actually predicting and also avoid trying to train the model to identify. So if we use the, the target of the, the CDL for this particular field, the CDL obviously has looked at the entire year to make that prediction. And if we were trying to predict the crop type uh, using only data from the spring time here, um, the model really shouldn't be able to identify what type of crop that is. So it could be 
actually adding in bad gradients to the model um, if we try to use a, a, some of this data along with the training target to train the model. So we, we do want to ignore this during training for that, re for that reason. Okay, um, and now we'll talk a little bit about how we've taken the CDL uh, values and, and uh, boiled them down into some of the classes we care to work with. Uh, the CDL actually has uh, quite a few numbers of labels, um, more than 100 uh, that, that you could actually find, um, but we really don't have the, all those labels available, um, or at least we don't have sufficient data for all those, uh, those, those different categories available from the area we're looking at. Um, so we really want to focus in on uh, maybe where there's uh, some classes or categories that have sufficient data and that we might be more interested in. And then, and then uh, for the other areas, we can kind of group them together into other classifications. So an example of that could be uh, we have quite a bit of data from corn, um, soybeans, cotton, and rice. We showed some of that in part one of this series, um, some of the data distributions. And, you know, the other other crops that are out there, uh, really, we don't have, like, an example, that could be peanuts. We don't have a ton of that. So we will just ge generally group those into cultivated areas. Um, and then besides that, those two those categories uh, of, or those specific categories of these crops and then a general crop category, we reserve uh, one, another one for uncultivated areas in case there's, like, um, developed area within there that we sampled or something that's water or something that's just not not really uh, a cultivated area um, and then the the final uh, value is we talked about this earlier but it there could be an area where there's just no crop growing but it's also it doesn't fit into the uncultivated area so we may just want to uh, say that right now there's no crop growing but there could be in the future um, okay so that by doing so, we reduce uh, the, the number of categories we need to predict from hundreds down to a, around six. Um, this is highly customizable. This is what we do for this example, but uh, you can obviously modify this to, be, to fit whatever uh, you would like to do for your application. Some of the mappings, uh, again, more specifically speaking, the labels we're, we're looking at that we want to focus on from a crop standpoint are corn, soybeans, cotton, and rice. Um, some other crops that are present in our data are shown here. Uh, we don't have a lot of it, so we're not. We're going to kind of just group those into a general category. Uh, uncultivated area again is anything that doesn't fall into the these other categories here, where it's not a crop. It's 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 not um, a cultivated area at all. So this could be grassland. It could be um, water, it could be urban area, something like that. So the, our final training list uh, of labels uh, looks like this. And um, this, is, this is how we end up uh, essentially outputting uh, the, the labels from our model. And uh, one note about the, the way that these labels are formed when you're training a model, uh, the way that the models work is there's a, a, a specific dimensionality to the output. So if we have six labels that we want to predict. Um, in this case, you know, we might be predicting these six labels here, and then the default is no crop growing if the, the scene classification layer um, doesn't have any vegetation present. But we'll predict, so if our dimensionality is six, we will actually, for classification, uh, do what's called one-hot encoding. Um, one-hot encoding essentially says, all right, whatever the class is, we're going to label that as a one, everything else gets a zero. So. Uh, if the CDL label for this particular row or this particular area, you know, if we have a, a, a pixel that was corn for 2019, for instance, and that's in our training data, we would essentially get a label uh, that's uh, six, six, it's got six elements, and this this one, if this was our corn element, that one would get a one. Um, and so you can just see how this works here. So uh, again, if, if we've got, you know, uh, indexes zero through five, for, for six elements, one of those indexes, so index zero could be uncultivated area, index one could be cultivated, index two could be corn, and et cetera. And then it, it gets a one depending on what the CDL well was, was it, uh, specified for that year. And that concludes the slide deck part of this presentation. Uh, we're gonna move after this into the demo where Eric will show everyone how to do all of this in DataBridge Community Edition with Python and TensorFlow.
Thanks. Eric? Thanks, John. Yep, I will be given the uh, demo of the code for part two um, in Databricks. So just a reminder, um, we'll be using Databricks Community Edition. Um, you will need to set up an account if you wanted to follow along and run the code. Uh, to run the code in Databricks Community Edition and all the instructions uh, will be on the web page. To load the part two code, we'll provide a Python file that you can upload into Databricks Community Edition by going into your workspace, navigating to kind of your user file, and then right clicking here and then clicking the import where you can drop a file from your local computer uh, that will upload it into the Databricks workspace. Once you're in there, then you can click into the file and then uh, you should be all set to go to run the demo. Um, so one quick note, um, if you recall from part one, uh, we do have to kind of create a cluster, a Databricks cluster that will be the compute that runs uh, the actual code in the notebook. Um, one change is in part two. Uh, I ran this with the DBR 13.3 LTS uh, software version of Databricks runtime. Um, this might work with other versions, um, but your success uh, may differ. Um, but this should be guaranteed to run using the 13.3 LTS. And to set that up um, on your cluster, when you go to create your cluster, you can just specify the runtime that you want to use, and you can specify the 13.3 LTS and then create the cluster. I already have a cluster spun up. Um, so we should be good to go. And I did pre-run this notebook in the interest of time. Um, we will be installing two packages with PIP. Uh, the main two packages is TensorFlow and TensorFlow IO uh, with these specified versions. Um, these are the only other required dependencies that are not pre-installed on the cluster uh, to be able to run the notebook. From there, we'll also imp import the other necessary functions uh, to run the code. So, okay, the first step is we'll need to load the data that we processed in part one. These data files uh, were saved as zip files and they are also available in the uh, training website. Uh, to upload these into Databricks, um, again, you can go into kind of the catalog section, go into DBFS, um, and you'll see another file kind of structure directory, store them. You go, go into the file store. Um, I uploaded them into tables and then you can upload, click the upload button and then kind of drop those zip files in here and they will upload into this table directory uh, and will persist um, into the Databricks file store. And so anytime that you kind of uh, come back into Databricks, your files will be uh, saved there um, anytime you log in. So after those files are uploaded, we can kind of run the this command. Uh, this is a, a way, kind of a pre-built command in Databricks um, to kind of list files in the Databricks file store. Uh, and we can see when I go to the file store tables, uh, we can see the two files, uh, the two zip files uh, exist from that we created in part one. Um, they exist now um, in our file store and I can use them to uh, create the data loader for this part two example. Um, first, before we can do any processing uh, of the data, we need to copy these files into the local driver node, uh, which is the cluster uh, compute uh, file system. And so we can do that using uh, the Databricks utils uh, file store copy command. Where we're copying from the Databricks file store into the local file system of the driver node. Once we do that, uh, we will need to unzip these files into their native parquet format. And we can do that using just a terminal uh, Linux shell commands uh, using unzip. Once that's done, then we should have the native Parquet file um, that we generated from part one. Um, and we can kind of display some useful statistics here just to make sure that the, the data looks proper. Um, here, I actually grouped it um, by the cropland data layer label and the year just to kind of see the data distribution of our labels. Um, and they all look correct. Um, as expected, we have a majority of, of soybeans, uh, rice, corn, and cotton labels, along with um, some woody woodlands in this region. 
so the data looks looks good um looks like we loaded it in properly um so so now the the first step uh, we need to do is to kind of split these parquet files which again are just directories of um multiple separate files is what a parquet file system is and so what we'll do is we'll actually separate the uh, training files and or the the data files into train val and test splits and we can do that um, using the native parquet file structure uh, as we partitioned by the year and so since we want to split by the year we can use kind of glob to kind of filter out all of the files that only exist in the year that we want so for train that would be 2021 for validation 2020 and test files uh, for 2019. Uh, and so then once we kind of load the file locations, uh, the data files that we want to load, the parquet files that we want to load for data loader, we can kind of see how many files would exist in each data set. Next, we'll need to kind of define some of the project variables that the data loader will use. These will be constant variables um, as we create the data loader. Um, first, we'll define kind of which buckets uh, of the seed cropland data layers labels will exist um, and which ones we want to identify when we create our custom label. So the first one, as we um, like mentioned in the, in the slides, we want to target kind of soybeans, rice, corn, and cotton. So we'll add that into its own kind of targeted cultivated crops list. We'll also want to crop uh, identify all other crops as cultivated. And so this is the list of crops that exist in this area in our data set um, that are other crops uh, that we'll, we'll identify as cultivated. And then last, we'll kind of create this label legend, which is just a nice human readable format um, for you know which index, uh, which label is, is included in which index. Um, so include, uh, this includes the uncultivated, which is all kind of urban areas as our label, cultivated, which is all the other crop types, the no crop growing, which is that special uh, example where there is crops growing, but there's no recent vegetation in the image, um, and then our targeted uh, cultivated crops list. Next, we'll define some of the kind of model batch um, sizes and time series bucketing size. These are just kind of parameters that you can tune depending on your use case. Um, here, what we're going to do is define a batch size of 1,028, um, which is a useful um, batch size that we kind of tuned a little bit uh, when training the model in part three. And 1028 uh, was it was a useful was a useful size. This, these next three parameters uh, define how we, um, how long the bucketized function will look, uh, what view it is. Um, in, in our case, we used a view of 120 days long with five days per bucket. Um, and then using these, we can, con we can define how many images will be contained within each regularly spaced bucketized time series um, kind of using these two uh, parameters in this function. Okay, next, um, as John mentioned in the slides, what we'll be doing in this example, since all the data um, can fit into memory, we will load it all into memory using kind of the TensorFlow from Tensor Slices after reading it in with Pandas Read Parquet. Um, what this will do is read in all of the files that we filtered before um, as Parquet files in Pandas data frame and then convert that into a TensorFlow data set. Um, and then that will uh, that TensorFlow data set will then be further processed using the map function in the next step. I do offer, so I did mention this is all in memory since, since this example does fit in memory and for performance reasons, since we're uh, working with a little bit limited compute and Databricks community version, um, this makes it so the code runs faster uh, within this environment. But if your data, for example, didn't fit in, within memory, if it was too big, then you can do kind of a from disk implementation example um, where it will load in each file individually um, in the queue and not load it all in in memory at once. Um, and this is one kind of commented out since we won't be using it, um, but one code example of how you might want to, you, how you might be able to do that um, in your own kind of code implementations if your data did not fit in memory. Uh, the main differences here is that you can use the TFIO from Parquet instead of the pandas reader. Um, to read the files and then load, instead of loading kind of all the data as a TensorFlow data set, you can load all the files as a TensorFlow data set that will be read 
using the read parquet file with the TensorFlow IO from parquet uh, with the, either the flat map function or the interleave function. And then that enables you uh, to kind of queue each file from disk instead of from memory. But again, for this example, we are sticking with the in-memory implementation since um, it is a little bit more performant for, for Databricks Community Edition. Okay, so next we're going to define all of our kind of custom functions that will be, that will do the bulk of the work, including um, creating our custom label from the raw cropland data land layer, uh, cropland data uh, labels, and then bucket our time series, uh, and then define our cut parse function and our filtering functions. So first, uh, I won't get into all the details since there's a lot of code here and I'll allow you to uh, peruse and go into detail and run this and experiment uh, for yourselves, but I'll go over kind of a high level of what each of these functions does and each of these steps. So in the create label, this is defining how we're um, taking the raw CDL labels, converting them into our own custom uh, targeted label space. What this is ultimately doing is taking those predefined lists above and checking to see if if the label, uh, if the cropland data land uh, label is contained in our targeted cultivated crops list, then set the label to be the index uh, of this list. So this would be um, 0, 1, 2, or 3, plus um, 3 to allow room for the other uh, labels that we want to exist. Um, similarly, if it's not included in that, then set it as the other cultivated crop index. Um, and if it's uncultivated, set it to zero. And then lastly, um, we can take in the cropland data layer and the SCL, the scene classification layer, to then specify our special no crop growing label um, and set that as two if the cropland data layer label is a crop that's growing, but there's no recent vegetation in the past two images. Um, if that's true, then we'll set this as no crop growing and the label will be uh, the integer two. Uh, next, we'll get into how we define the logic for the bucket uh, time series. So we're this is when we're going to be taking um, our irregularly spaced time series data and converting it into a bucketized version of a of regularly spaced time series using the uh, parameters that we used before of days per bucket and days in series. Um, so the first step what we'll do is uh, this is uh, we'll be randomly sampling uh, the time range for the imagery. So that time range of 120 days will be taking a uh, randomly sampled date range um, and filtering the data between that date range. Um, we will grab all the data that exists within that date range. And then this is um, something special here uh, that we will randomly sample without replacement those images within that time frame down to fit if there is more uh, images that exist within that time series. If there's like, for example, duplicate images, um, we will randomly sample without replacement those images down to, to a proper size. And this randomly sampling uh, has some benefits, including um, kind of increasing the combinations of images that the model will see in the time series, which will help uh, improve model uh, training stability and generalization as well. If there's no images in this selected time range, we'll fill with zero values. So if for whatever reason we are randomly sampled time range has no data, uh, no image data available, then we'll just fill that uh, with zeros. So there'll be no data and then pass that along into the model. Lastly, uh, now that we have this, this filtered, randomly sampled um, time range of, of, of imagery data, we will bucket the data based on their position in the time series um, using this function here. If there are multiple images in the same bucket, so if there are two images taken um, near each other that would fall in the same uh, bucket that we define, we need to randomly sample or select one of those. And so that's what this, this code does here. And then lastly, um, we'll actually do that kind of bucketizing uh, transform and, and padding the data with zero values. Um, and we'll do that with the uh, TensorFlow scatter ND function is kind of doing the bulk of the work here. Um, and then 
that will be kind of our bucketized and padded uh, regularly spaced time series of imagery that will return from this function. OK, now the parse function will kind of combine all of these uh, functions and logic that we um, used to actually create the uh, final pair of training data and label that the model will expect um, from the data set. And so the first thing that we do is, uh, if you recall, the data is in byte string format in the parquet file. So first we'll decode these from bytes into real usable values using the TFIO uh, decode raw function. We'll also define um, some additional helper functions, um, including like the days from the start of series, uh, which will be used kind of in the future steps, um, like for the bucketizing functions. Um, we'll define that here. Uh, additionally, uh, if you wanted to do some feature engineering or compute other variables um, for uh, debugging purposes, you could do that here. For uh, I compute the normalized difference vegetation index from our band values just for debugging purposes. This won't be used by the model, but it's useful to kind of validate our data um, and visualize it um, in a time series format. And so we'll, we'll see some examples of that later down um, in the code. Um, then we will bucketize our time series data after we've decoded it using the function that we defined above and create our custom label. And we'll define that as Y. That's a common nomenclature to do so in machine learning, um, define our labels Y. Um, and then lastly, um, we during training, we want to normalize the data. And so this next step, we'll, we'll be normalizing the data. Um, additionally, if we're in training and we, we want to only use the band values for training the model. And so we will select the first 12 features, which is the first 12 bands. Uh, if we're not normalizing, then we'll just kind of pass it through and this will be used for debugging. And we'll just kind of pass all the data out if we're not training the model, um, which will be useful for if we want to debug our, our, our training pro our, our data loader. Lastly, uh, we will one hot encode the labels and then actually apply the normalization of the data values um, here. Importantly, we will need to pre compute the uh, mean and standard deviation values for each of the band values, and we'll do that in the next step. Um, and I'll show you how to do that. Um, but they were pre computed here. Um, I've already done that kind of step ahead of time. Um, and so then once we have the mean and standard deviations for each of the feature columns, then we can apply the normalization. Um, and importantly here, we only want to do the normalization uh, on the uh, non padded value, the non zero values. Um, and so we kind of can apply a mask here to ignore those zero values when we go and normalize the feature values uh, or the band values. And lastly, we'll return X, which is our training data, and Y, which is our training label. Um, the last function that we need to define is our kind of filter function. Uh, the only filtering that we do in this example is filtering out kind of the double cropping labels as um, we just don't want to, to predict on those. And so this is one method that we can do that using the TensorFlow strings uh, regex function. We can take the CDL labels and filter out any uh, CDL labels that contain that double uh, text. So now that we have all of our custom functions defined, we can put all that together and define our final TensorFlow training data set using the exact same code that we had in the, in the slides where we'll take kind of the training data set of files. Um, we'll filter the double croppings, we'll shuffle the data, we'll then map our custom parse function, uh, specifying that we want to normalize. We're going to be using this for training. Um, so we do set normalization to true, so it only passes the the 12 band values that we want for training and we'll normalize them. We will set uh, parallel uh, calls to TensorFlow Auto-Tune to improve performance. We will then batch based on the patch size that we specified before and prefetch to improve performance. And we'll do the same thing for the validation set as well. We can view an example output of the XY pairs using kind of this next iter on the train data set as these train data sets, um, they are lazy loaders. And so they're actually Python generators. And so we can 
um, you can't index them directly, but you can um, kind of iterate uh, you ge generators in Python using this uh, code here. And then we can see kind of the example of the data um, with the X being a TensorFlow uh, tensor of shape, uh, 1028, which is our batch size, 25, which is our regularized uh, length of bucketized time series data, and there are 12 uh, bands, satellite bands from, from Sentinel-2. And then our label associated with that, which is our one hot encoded um, values or labels, uh, custom labels that have a uh, shape of 1028, which is our batch size, uh, and seven, because uh, we have seven labels. So next, I did kind of want to demo, now that we have all the, the training data sets defined, I did want to compare the performance improvements of loading your data with parallelization and prefetching and comparing that when you don't specify parallelization and prefetching. Um, so in, for this test, uh, I just define one data set that doesn't have parallelization and one data set that does have parallelization. And then to test the performance, I'll just kind of run a very, very small, um, simple model uh, with with uh, just one kind of dense layer that's the size of the label outputs, and then run those through the model with one epoch just to test to see what the performance differences is. And we can see um, with the no parallelization example, the one epoch takes about 46 seconds uh, at about almost 600 milliseconds per step. Per step. Um, and the parallelization example runs at 36 seconds uh, with 436 milliseconds per step. So we can see that there is a noticeable speed improvement by using the parallelization techniques. Um, and especially if you run this outside of kind of the Databricks community environment with a CPU uh, or, or compute that has much, many more CPUs um, than two, parallelization will help you even more in those cases when you're, when you're training this on a uh, kind of beefier computer. So I mentioned um, in our data loader, there's one last step that we need to do, which is compute the mean and standard deviation so that we can enable normalization of our data. Um, and so what we'll do here is we'll kind of create a separate kind of test data set where we don't uh, define the normalization because uh, we want kind of an unnormalized data set to then compute the, norm, uh, the mean and standard deviation of that unnormalized data set. Uh, we will loop through this data set to kind of cache uh, that raw data values um, and then reshape the data um, just to get the imagery values because we don't care about the other uh, data that gets passed th uh, through it, including like the NDVI, um, et cetera. And then once we have kind of our, our band values, then we can compute the mean and standard deviation of our non-normalized data set. Um, and again, we want to ignore kind of the padded values. Um, so we're, we're kind of masking out and ignoring zero values from this calculation. And this results in the means uh, and the standard deviation values for each of the 12 bands. So what you would do after you kind of run this is you can copy these values directly from here into the mean and standard deviation values that are uh, defined up here. And I've already done that, so I won't do it again, but you would do that for both the means and the standard deviations to find here. And these are just constants that, um, that you don't have to change. You only have to do this once. You don't have to change it after you set them the first time, unless your data set changes. So that, that is our final defined data set. Um, so now that we've defined kind of all this logic um, and we have our data set set, uh, we're going to want to kind of do some visualizations just to confirm that everything is working as expected. Um, so the first thing I want to, comp uh, to, to, to test is to see if the normalization is working as expected, if the data values uh, appear to be within a reasonable range. Um, so we're going to kind of compare the normalized data set with the non-normalized data set um, using violin plots. Um, and we can see the first plot is the normalized data set distribution. Um, we can see that all the values are somewhat centered around zero um, with some tip differing tails, um, but that makes sense. Um, and this, this looks as expected. This looks like normalized data. And then we can compare that to kind of the non-normalized data set with the, the norm equals false filter and the parse function. And uh, we can see that, yeah, absolutely. These are non-normalized data uh, with very large kind of values. Um, 
and with different kind of distributions. And so um, this also kind of shows why normalization is uh, necessary. Um, but yep, we can see, we can confirm the normalization worked um, from this plot. So that's great. Uh, it also, since we have a custom label function, we want to see, you know, what's our distribution in our final labels as it will differ from the, you know, raw cropland data layer um, labels. Um, we can see uh, we have a good amount of uncultivated and no crops growing pixels, which makes sense because a bulk, uh, the bulk of most of the year, there's no crops growing. And so we're going to have more kind of labels in total in our data set where there's no crops growing. Um, cultivated, again, there's not, you know, it's all other crops. Uh, the majority of crops in this region are, are soybeans, rice, corn, and cotton. Um, and so the cultivated, like things like peanuts uh, or winter wheat uh, are not as common. Um, so looking at this, this all makes sense uh, given uh, what, you know, the, tr the, the label transforms that we defined. And then lastly, uh, we'll define, uh, we'll plot kind of some time series data to check uh, that our bucketing function works as expected. Um, and so we can like, go through kind of our, we'll, we'll use our non-normalized data set for this just so we can visualize the NDVI values, which will be useful for, for kind of plotting this in a time series. Um, and we can see if we run this, and we'll give nine examples uh, from the training set. Um, but we can see similar to the, the plots in the, in the uh, the demo or, or the uh, slideshow, um, we can see a time series of images that range from zero to 25 uh, consistently. Uh, and during those 25 images in our defined 120 time range with bucketed days of five, uh, we can see this is a soybeans example um, and it's properly labeled. This looks like a kind of a soybeans or something's definitely growing here. And we have a recent vegetation pixel for the last image, last two images that we have. So this is properly labeled as, as soybeans. Um, this example, however, we have a no crop growing and we can see something was growing here. Um, however, the past two images that we have are not vegetated. Um, and so this is correctly identifying this as no crop growing, or this, lo this looks right. Um, additionally, it looks like our padding of values is, is being applied properly, um, and everything kind of looks good here. Um, importantly, um, it is useful to know um, that, again, we are doing some random sampling of the data. And so when we run, if we run this again on our data set, we're actually going to get different plots. Um, because of that kind of random perturbations that we're doing in our training data set to improve kind of model generalization, uh, we're going to get kind of different data every time. So it's not going to be the same. Um, so this is also useful to kind of maybe run this a couple times um, just to see that and confirm that we are randomly sampling um, and we are getting different results every time. Um, but this is just another good way to just do another gut check to make sure that the, the, the data set is loading and, and doing the proper transforms that we, that we want. Uh, before we actually go into model training. And so that's it for the code demo uh, for part two. Next up, we will do uh, the model training using this data set that we defined here. Um, so yep, thanks for, for joining. Uh, back to you, John. All right, thank you, Eric. To summarize what we've learned today, We've created a very custom but highly efficient queue to load data in TensorFlow datasets. And specifically, this queue is focused on loading data from the Parquet files that had both cropland data layer uh, information and Sentinel-2 information from our part one of this series as inputs. We talked about some of the functions that TensorFlow datasets have such as the map, shuffle, batch, and prefetch functions that, that optimize the performance uh, while doing a lot of the work uh, to pre-process the data. Um, we, we talked a little bit about how we are using some functions like decode raw to convert the byte streams that we stored the data in from part one back into a format of data that's uh, usable for modeling. And we, we talked a lot about pre-processing steps. So uh, specifically, some things from that would be 
splitting the data into training, validation, and test data sets to avoid data leakage and track if the model's overfitting, uh, and also test generalization of performance. We normalize the data for training stability. We bucketed the irregularly spaced time series data into regular spacing intervals so that it could be modeled with a 1D CNN. And we modified the CDL target variables so that they would align with what's needed by the, the model training code. Looking into part three, we're going to train a 1D CNN off of this data. So by using the data loader that we've created here, we're going to be able to finalize the and close the loop on this, this uh, series it, with, a, with a model that can predict crop type from Sentinel-2 in real time. We're going to show how to model the, the uh, to track the model performance in Databricks using TensorBoard during the training process. And we'll finally test the results by visualizing the model predictions in various ways. Thank you. Thank you, John. Before we transition to the question and answer session, I want to remind everyone there will be one homework assignment which you will be able to access from the training page on March 19th. Answers must be submitted by Google Form with a due date of April 1st. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all three live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate via email approximately two months after the completion of the course. Below is the contact information for Dr. John Just and Eric Sorensen, along with links to the RSET website and social media. We hope you'll sign up on the RSET listserv to receive notifications of future trainings, and follow us on Twitter for announcements pertaining to NASA's Earth Sciences. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's training. Please enter your questions in the question and answer box, and we will get to them in the order that they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training webpage before the start of next week's training. Okay, hello all. Hey, John. Hey there. I want to thank everybody that's been submitting their questions. We've gotten some really good ones so far. So again, we do encourage those that are online, please do submit your questions to the Q&A box, and we will try to get through all of them in the next uh, 23 minutes or so. So jumping right into it, question one, how do we determine the best data set for training and testing the machine learning model? The partition of the data into training and testing is usually done randomly using a random state. Yeah, this is where domain expertise definitely comes into play. Um, you know, if someone's kind of naive uh, about, you know, the, the nature of uh, this, this type of data, they may kind of approach this in an incorrect way. If you randomly sample all your data across time and space, in a very naive sense, you're going to get uh, what we call information leakage. And therefore, your model will actually, uh, it'll overfit the patterns that aren't uh, generalizable. And so it's very important um, to make sure from a, from a data selection standpoint, first of all, of course, you want to match whatever your, whatever your goals are, you want to match the distribution of your data as closely as possible. So if your goals are a certain, cert, to detect certain crop types, um, you should definitely focus your training data on that. But beyond that, you know, when you do split up your, your training and test and you're randomly sampling it, so to speak, you want to make sure that you kind of cluster areas together. So uh, areas or time frame. So one one way we do this is we kind of say, all right, we're going to make 2019. We're going to use all the same area, but 2019 uh, will be our training data, and then we'll use 2020 as validation and 2021 as test. Um, you know, if you were to do this more extensively, you might want to say, okay, let's use 20, uh, 2017 all the way to 2020 as training, and then you know, validation and test could be 2021, 2022, something like that. But you know, you really want to avoid information leakage. Otherwise, um, you're you're going to overfit, and your generalization is going to be more poor. And when you look at your your validation, your testing data, you're going to think it's performing better than it actually does. And when you apply it in reality, great. Thanks, John. Question number two on slide twenty-two regarding the overfitting chart. You mentioned that at a certain point, you can early stop the model in order to avoid overfitting. How could the model be stopped when it is already running? Would this not crash the process? 
Do you need to include the stopping condition in the parameters of the model so it stops by itself? Yeah, so um, TensorFlow has what they call callbacks, which can add some additional functionality during the training process. Um, one of these uh, modules that they provide here in the callbacks is these is this ability to early stop training. Um, it'll it'll basically track the validation metric or any other metric that you define, and if it if it doesn't improve over a number uh, sp of specified training steps, it will stop the training and then save the best performing model. Um, so, yep, uh, we'll get into more details of this in part three, but we do utilize um, or use the early stopping callback in the training process to do this. Thank you, Eric. Question number three. In the last slide, how is the value of NDVI between zero to 100? The value of NDVI lies between negative one to one. I think I missed something, so I just want to clear this up. Yeah, so in the code, we just kind of scaled NDVI values uh, by multiplying them by 100. Um, so we actually got a range of negative 100 to 100. Um, but then for, for graphing purposes, we narrowed the range down to zero to one. So uh, yeah, the scaling to zero to 100 doesn't really mean anything uh, in a meaningful sense. It was just for kind of visualization purposes. Great, thanks, sir. Question four. Uh, hello, please, I don't have access to the database file database on Databricks. Could you check the access? Yeah, this is a question we got in um, the, the the first session as well. Um, and so what you want to do is we, we provide a link here, but there is a to get that toggle where you can actually toggle to the Databricks file system um, when you're looking at the uh, the catalog, um, you're gonna you need to enable it. And so we have some instructions here we linked that you can go to to uh, to enable the uh, the DBFS toggle. Great, thanks, John. Question five. Does this data work if we want to focus on flood damage assessment on crop monitoring? Yeah, this this is a good question. To, like extending this approach to, um, and the intention was always to build it this way. Extending the the approach to other targets is certainly doable. Um, you, the only thing you really need to do here is, um, you know, it does require domain expertise. Again, you know, there's a there's a part to this that you have to make sure you your training data. Um, considers the, the the challenge of this this task. So, um, you know, I think the person that was we were talking with was is looking at like Pakistan, and so in Pakistan, what you're going to and you're dealing with rice. So rice is a is a field that is a crop type that actually typically floods normally, anyways, uh, to water the crop um, early on, and so um, you're trying to distinguish between natural flooding and uh, you know, natural unplanned flooding, and then, you know, some type of agricultural controlled flooding of the field. Um, and so some of that could be, you know, captured probably in the time series, you know, in terms of when the actual flooding happens and the extent, uh, the, the time that it, it actually remains flooded, as well as some of the depth that might be especially deep, which causes different reflectances. So my assumption is all you need to do here uh, as a starting point is just get your targets down so you know where, you know, what the difference, you, you're trying to classify flood damage versus not flood damage, right? So the first thing to do is get your targets situated so that they kind of match the format of the CDL data. Um, and that format's just intended so that you can subsequently follow up and acquire all the Sentinel-2 data and then train your models. So I think as long as your targets set up properly, this should be, you know, it should it should follow the exact same process we've laid out here. Thanks, John. Question six, do we need an AWS account to run these notebooks in Databricks? So yeah, the Databricks Community Edition, you don't have to worry about setting up an AWS account uh, or Azure account. Uh, it'll take care of all that for you. Um, if you do end up using a, a paid Databricks account, uh, you go that route, um, you would have to set up an AWS or Azure account uh, to be connected to the Databricks uh, so you can set up compute in either of those environments. But yeah, for this training, if you're using Databricks Community, you don't have to worry about creating a separate account. Okay, thanks, Eric. Question seven. I wanna focus on flood monitoring and crop damage assessment using remote sensing. Uh, looks like they wanna use some optical and radar data and high resolution imagery with planet small sat constellations. So are crop types important? Ah, okay. So let me, let me uh, I didn't have a chance to look at this, but um... If you are, okay, I want to focus on flood monitoring. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I, I think this was actually the same 
I, I think this was actually uh, an extension of the same question that was asked earlier um, regarding flood uh, flood monitoring and, and using our you know using the same process to 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 predict that. Um, so I think and I think I covered that in my last answer where yeah crop type is important because of exactly I mean this is domain expertise but it's a, in your case. Um, you're looking at a crop like where there's a lot of rice in Pakistan. So rice naturally, you know, you're flooding, you're controlled flooding the field typically. So, you know, you're looking at a situation where there is kind of a flood in the field typically, and you're trying to distinguish that from uh, like an actual damaging uncontrolled natural flood. And so, uh, you know, in that case, um, you know, it, you do have to consider the fact that your your crop type is is a very you know has an unusual characteristic about it. Because if you were to look at corn, it's not ever typical to have that. So any type of water in the field in, in a corn field or a soybean field is a problem that's not expected. But in rice, it's expected. So yeah, you absolutely do want to consider that. Great, thanks, John. Uh, question eight. Out of curiosity. Why do you use the term bucket instead of the more commonly used bin or temporal window composite? Yeah, so there's no particular reason we use the word bucket versus bin or a temporal window composite. Um, the meaning here is the same. Um, in my opinion, bucketize is kind of more fun to say than uh, binning, but that's, I think that's maybe why I lean toward it. Awesome, thanks, Eric. Question nine, uh, can we use the same code like an example uh, with our sample data? Yep. Yep. That, that was the intention of all of this, you know, I, kind of uh, similar to the previous flood monitoring one that we were talking about, you know, just make sure that your target data, whatever it is, if it's regression or classification, just get it formed uh, in the, the, the same format that we showed in uh, part one of this series, the first script where we're acquiring the CDL data, run your script or run, run our typical script on that, get the CDL data, it only takes a couple minutes, and look at the output of that and get a feel for what the format of this, because everything downstream uses that to acquire Sentinel-2 data. So if you get the format just matched like that, everything downstream is gonna work fine. Great, thanks, John. Question 10, uh, did you try to normalize with all data versus only training data? So, no, um, we should only calculate the normalization factors on our training uh, data set, not the validation and test sets. So leave those out when calculating the normalization factors, the mean of standard deviation, um, and then you would apply those mean of standard deviation values um, to the, the same ones that were calculated on the training set to the validation and the test data. Great, thanks, Eric. Question 11, uh, will CDL monthly data be released soon? Is it feasible? Um, I mentioned this, uh, I did have a, an answer to this in the Q and A. It was a good question. Like, I, I'm not aware of them being, uh, thinking about releasing a monthly version of this. Um, the two reasons I'm, I'm aware of them not doing this more often. One of those being just the cost uh, to run it across the, the entire United States uh, for the given resolution and, you know, higher frequencies. Um, and then the other one being that markets are sensitive to the, what crops are being grown. And so, um, uh, you know, I don't think the, the USDA is trying to um, provide information that, you know, would, would cause markets to, to you know, uh, react to uh, too significantly in this case, um, to my understanding. So. Great. Right, thanks, John. Question 12. Are the same means and standard deviations used for both the training and test set, or is it recomputed given a new raster? Yeah, this is similar to the previous question. Um, just calculate the, the mean of standard deviations on the, the training set, and you'll apply that, that same uh, calculated mean of standard deviations from the, the training set on the validation and test data and any other future data that the, uh, the, the model will uh, run inference on. Great, thanks, Eric. And question 13, what sensor do you recommend using radar or optical to monitor and predict land use and vegetation in the central zone of Mexico? And what other sources of information do you recommend combining? Yeah, again, a great, a great question. And you're jumping ahead to, you know, what, what next after this? Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm going to say just start with doing, uh, and I, I didn't finish the entire thought here, but um, start with kind of figuring out what, what's the, what type of vegetation, what type of land use do you typically expect to see there? And, you know, uh, try to acquire that from the CDL. So build your model just based on optical, like Sentinel-2 is a starting point, like we've shown here. Uh, get something working, you know, make sure it's kind of, you know, doing something reasonable for um, that area. And um, once you feel like, okay, I've, I've been able to apply this to my area, um, then, then you can start adding other sources if you feel like that's going to help uh, improve the, the um, accuracy of your model. But, you know, there's, there may not be a need. I mean, I don't think, like the CDL for uh, the U.S. really doesn't use radar, to my knowledge. I think there's one in Canada for land cover predictions that does use Sentinel-1. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a, you know, there's, there's the CDL does pretty well without it. So you may want to focus on just optical at first. So maybe if you get Sentinel-2 working, you feel like you need higher temporal resolution, maybe add in a Landsat because they do have a, um, a particular data set available where they've uh, it's it's available from uh, I can't remember if it's USGS or ESA uh, maybe Sean you know but it's they basically combined Lan uh, Sentinel two and Landsat and they've kind of reconciled uh, the differences between those those band values to to align them um, I forget what the call the, maybe Eric do you remember what the name of that data set is Yeah it's HLS Harmonized HLS. Landsat Sentinel That's it. Yes. Yeah. Harmonized, harmonized land set sentinel data set. Yep. Yeah, we'll we'll put a link to that in uh, in the chat so everybody can go and explore for themselves. Was there any other questions? Uh... Just dropped a link in the chat to the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel. Um, yeah, we do encourage, there's still about 10 minutes left. So if anybody has a question that they've been wanting to ask and for whatever reason they, they weren't able to or did not want to submit it until now, please do. Uh, we, encourage, we encourage questions. Uh, there's no bad questions, so please do so ask them. I also want to let everybody know that following next week's uh, third part of the webinar series, there will be a survey sent out to all the participants. So we do strongly encourage you uh, when you receive that survey, please, please do submit it, uh, fill it out and submit it. It will take no more than five minutes. And it's incredibly valuable for the RSET team, uh, for John and Eric to get the feedback. And it really helps to improve all future training. So the more feedback you're able to get us, uh, it really does how, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it really factors into how we plan our trainings, what trainings that we, we try to offer, and also how we prepare for those trainings. So we do encourage uh, that when you do receive that survey, please do take the time to fill it out, and we would uh, greatly, greatly appreciate it. So that will be following uh, next Tuesday um, at the last part of the webinar series. So it looks like we are getting... Dorsa, uh, yeah, we got one in here. So Dorsa, uh, some, Dorsa asked, uh, is the planet data three-minute resolution better uh, for predicting crop type than Sentinel one, um, it's it, it really depends on your use case. You know, it, it depends on what your limitations are. Um, if if you're in an area, so like I'll give you an example. Um, some places in Brazil have so much cloud cover that optical satellites almost never can can see the the area. Um, and so in that case, you know, uh, even the high uh, the high temporal spatial resolution uh, of planet isn't going to really matter because you can't you can't get through and see the area. So you know you're going to want to use Sentinel Sentinel one there. Uh, you know in other areas where you have pretty good um, visibility of the of the land, you you're probably going to want to bias towards if you have access to planet, you probably don't want to bias towards that because of the high uh, temporal spatial temporal resolution. Um, so I, I don't know that'd be my thoughts. I'd also say if cost is uh, important. Um, for your use case, you know, planet's not, you know, planet does cost money, um, but you know, Sentinel one is not. So again, it, that's another kind of factor to consider. Great. It looks like we got another question 15, uh, about the approach on training, uh, using one year of data testing and other validating another year. This has the complication of drought years, which can complicate the classification 
Is there an approach that considers training, validation, and test with mixed years considering the same region sampling? Yeah, I'm, I, I think that's a, you know, that's a great question. And um, there was a similar uh, question asked earlier, kind of along these lines where, um, you know, it's asking like, how do you decide on your training and test data? And that's, that's where it's really important to have some domain knowledge. Um, when you look at the fact that there can be uh, very large seasonality changes in temperature and the precipitation available, um, you know, you, you kind of, and you expect that to happen. Um, you know that you need to sample probably across years um, and include those in your training data. So, you know, as, as an example, um, usually what we like to do is, you know, historically, if you can go back and use, um, the, you know, three to five years at least in your training data set uh, for the areas that cover, you know, the crop types you're interested in. If you can do that, you're you're you are generally going to be covering you know, a, a little bit wider range of seasonality differences, and you're going to make your model more robust for that. So, you know, that's what we recommend um, as a, just as a, as a rule of thumb or as a starting point. Um, certainly, if you, you know, if you get some really, really big outlier, uh, you know, drought year um, that, that shows up that you weren't expecting or it's really hot for whatever reason, unusually hot and that somehow causes a different response in the, the crop phenology, how it grows, um, you know, that could, that could cause some issues, but, um, you know, as, as much as possible, try to, try to sample across the, as many years as, as, as you can in your training data while still reserving enough to uh, test on. John and Eric, I, th I think we've gotten through all the questions. Uh, thank you to everybody that did submit them. We really, really appreciate all the questions that came in. Uh, as we wrap up the second part of the webinar series, uh, John and Eric, maybe John, if you can go first, maybe any closing thoughts or comments on uh, on today's webinar as we as we head into next week. Yeah, thanks. We're really excited to see everybody from all over the world join and ask some really great questions. I love to hear, you know, what some people are doing. Really, uh, really enjoy being able to share this stuff with everyone, please reach out, let us know if you got any other questions or let us just let us know what you're working on. Um, you know, we, we're always interested to, to see and hear what people are doing. Yeah, I'll just ditto that. Um, it's been amazing to see all the engagement in the chat, a very engaged chat for, for a webinar in my experience. So um, thank you everybody for your engagement and your questions. And yeah, we're definitely excited to, to see and what people do with with this training um, in their own applications. So yeah, definitely reach out and let us know what you're doing. Awesome. Yeah, John and Eric, thank you both so much. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the RSET team that's been working uh, tirelessly in the background to help uh, promote and and put on this webinar series. That's Natasha Johnson Griffin, Brock, Brock Blevins, Selwyn Hudson Odoi, and Sarah Cutshaw. So thank you to the RSET team. I also want to thank all the participants today for joining, and we look forward to seeing you all next week at the same time. So take care of yourselves, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye.